Hey guys. All right. So I'm Martin. Uh, I was one of the co-founders of Nasira. I'm now the CTO of networking for VMware. And the focus of this talk is you know, we've been doing network virtualization as a community now for five, six, seven years. And so I want to talk about not just what network virtualization is, but kind of like how now that people have adopted it, how they're pushing it in to do new things. And, um, and I, I would like to step back and actually just talk a little bit about disruptive technologies in general. So like as technologists, we like to look at like the full extent of new technologies, right? Something like virtualization, I think we immediately go to things like cloud. But like, you know, our ability as technologists to see how powerful disruptive technologies are and the market's ability to consume it are entirely different, right? So even in the case of compute virtualization, when like, when like VMware, for example, first came out, they would take you know, compute virtualization, and they would sell it on these very, very simple principles, right? So like the early sales pitch for compute virtualization was server consolidation. It's about as simple as you can get, right? So you'd walk into a customer, you'd be like, listen, if you run VMware or if you run virtualization, in instead of buying you know, two physical servers, you buy one physical server and you save money, and that was, that was it. And when you have very simple kind of pitches, it's much easier for technologies to get adopted. It just is very difficult to go against kind of like the conventional practices of a company. And it all has to do with sales and go to market. However, once technologies get adopted, then it kind of captures the imagination. And once they're in place, you normally, especially with virtualization, you have like this, like the proverbial level of indirection in computer science, and you can take advantage of that position to do really cool stuff, right? And so, for example, in the case of server virtualization, we started out with this really simple value proposition of server consolidation, then you end up with cloud and all of the benefits that we see now. And so what I would like to talk about is like, I believe network virtualization is following the same type of trend, which is originally adoption was kind of around these very simple use cases, but now that it's been you know, adopted, put into practice, and used at scale, we're starting to see use cases that I certainly never imagined early on when we were developing this stuff. And so the way that I have split up this talk is to talk in two pieces. So the first piece, I, wanna, I just want to focus on background. If you guys have heard me talk before, or if you've heard talks about network virtualization, a lot of this will be um, uh, known to you. But I think it's good to get on the same page. So you just have to indulge me for the first part of the talk. I'm going to do background. And then I want to talk about kind of how this is evolving as technology in a purely technical sense to use cases, again, that we hadn't thought about on the outset. OK? So let me start. So what is network virtualization? Many of you know this, but just to get everybody on the same page, I want to go through it again. So in a data center, I'm going to step through an animation really quickly. So in a data center, you have physical switching gear. And in the case of network virtualization from the edge, it doesn't matter what switching gear you have, whether you have um, you know, standard traditional vendor gear, whether you have a simple L3 ECMP fabric on a white box, if you have IP over InfiniBand, you have whatever physical network that you have in place. I'll assume that it has IP connectivity. So of course, connected to the switches, you've got servers. And in a virtualized data center, on the servers, you'll run a hypervisor, and then that hypervisor has a vSwitch. So vSwitches in virtualized data centers today already handle every packet, right? Or at least every packet between the VM and another VM and the VM and the server, right? This is a software layer that will handle every packet. And so the idea of network virtualization, I'm going to use an analogy to server virtualization. So from the vSwitches, network virtualization creates what you can think of as a network hypervisor. So let me just draw an analogy with compute virtualization. So what is compute virtualization? So compute virtualization is a thin software layer that runs on the hardware that exposes a virtual machine abstraction. And that becomes the focal point of operations, right? Now instead of operators dealing with sheet metal and wires, it's dealing with you know, a software abstraction that has an API, it's full soft state, I mean, all the standard stuff that you know. So virtual networking does basically the same thing, independent of who builds the system, is it creates 
this layer that exposes virtual networks. So virtual networks, I mean, these are implemented in software at the edge. They look like physical networks, right? So they have all of the standard interfaces of physical networks. They'll support L2 and L3 and ingress ACLs and egress ACLs and L4 through 7 services, like firewalling or whatever. I mean, they look like physical networks, so they can support existing workloads. But they have the operational model of a VM, which means I can create them dynamically. I can grow them and shrink them and move them and clone them and snapshot them. And of course, this works out, you know, modifying or touching the hardware. I mean, that's the whole point is, you know, you already have servers. You already have vSwitches. If you can leverage this position, now you can create another operational abstraction so that you can automate the entire data center, including the networking portion. Generally, these are implemented in some sort of an overlay. It's a mechanistic. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the underlying mechanism. Generally, whether it's VXLAN or NVGRE or STT, normally the way that you decouple the address space from the virtual view, uh, from the physical view, is you use some sort of a tunneling. But from the perspective of a user or this perspective of a CMS like OpenStack, what's exported is a virtual, machine or a virtual network abstraction. That's kind of the net new, right? That's, that's like just like a hypervisor exposes a VM, it exposes a virtual network abstraction. And like I mentioned before, you want this to be complete because the goal is, is if you're going to be creating an operator abstraction in software, you want to be able to support all existing workloads and hopefully existing tool sets as well when it comes to things like provisioning and management and so forth. So for example, in a standard virtual network, you'll have L2, like I said. So this is basic L2 switching. You'll support L3 routing. Often, a virtual networking solution will support dynamic route advertisements to the physical network. So it just looks like an extension of the physical network. So for example, if things move around in the virtual L3 domain, it'll advertise and update the physical network to say things have moved. Support things like load balancing, firewalling, gateways, and so forth. So that's it. That's the focal point of abstraction. So like I mentioned before, when it came to compute virtualization, we had this idea early on of like, OK, what, you know, what's the simple use case? right? And that was server consolidation. And for network virtualization, we kind of had to come up with the same type of thing, which is, <laughs> and I think, I think we tried everything like early on. Like we're like, oh, OpEx. And like that was very difficult to argue about, because like you have to change, um, you know, I mean, there's an educational hurdle. Or maybe CapEx, but that's actually very difficult to argue about. And so now, five years later, having seen this, I can say that the primary driver for the adoption of network virtualization in the last five years, oh, actually, is, so the, the primary uh, driver to adoption is agility, which is the ability to, um, to provision things really quickly. So let me give you like a real high level view of how to think about network virtualization at kind of the, the techno conceptual perspective. Like, if you zoom back as far away as possible and you take an abs abstracted view of a data center, here's the best way to think about network virtualization. So if you look at modern SaaS data centers, think of like the Googles or um, you know, any kind of online site, there's this common characteristics in, in, in many of the modern ones, which is the physical network has become very, very simple, like a very simple L3 ECMP fabric. And then things that have typically been in the network, things like ACLs, security, fault isolation, things that we've actually found within the network have actually migrated into the application. And they're being rebuilt as part of the application. Right? This is something that's happened over the last 10 years. It has nothing to do with VMware. It has nothing to do with OpenFlow or Nasira or SDN. This is just like Darwin speaking on how you build good data centers. And what Darwin has said is like, if you build very simple physical fabrics and you put functionality in software, you get a lot of benefits, which are really obvious to people that do software, right? So instead of having to manage you know, CLIs through scripts, I now have objects that, I can, uh, that I'm programming and controlling directly because I've decoupled features from hardware. There's, there's clearly an, a, a CapEx play here. And, and more importantly, like the closer you are to the application, the more semantics you have, right? You're not guessing anymore. If, if I'm re-implementing a piece of security uh, as part of my application, I know something that's much higher level. I'm doing it at the right layer. It's just a, like a basic um, use of the end-to-end -end principle. And so, I mean, of the, you know, I've worked with some now, you know, a few hundred of these kind of new data centers, and I would say some large percentage of them say, 
you know, 60, 70 percent are actually built in this way, which is very different than what we think of for traditional data centers. But the problem is, is the only way to build this is you have to control the app, and sometimes you have to control the platform. So if I control my application and I control my platform, I can do all of these neat tricks, right? I can implement security. Um, I can implement my own types of discovery. I can implement my own types of failover and load balancing. Like all of this stuff I can implement as part of the application, and it's great. But if I don't own the app and it hasn't been written to support that, this no longer applies. And, and what I like to say is actually having worked with a lot of these kind of large SaaS data centers, it's actually interesting if you compare like the op models and the cost models between like their web presence and their internal IT. So if you look at like what they've built for like the website, you know, for like the website, like the, the, the software that is the service, the primary function of the data center, it's awesome. Right? It's, got, it's like everything's in software, it's decoupled from the hardware, it's got all the benefits I talk about. But then if you look at the IT, it's often exactly the opposite. You still have all of the problems that you have in normal IT. It takes a long time to provision things. It takes a long time to configure things, right? So just because you know how to build this for a new type of application doesn't mean that you can take that knowledge and then somehow move it into the problem of enterprise provisioning. OK, so if you compare this kind of modern SaaS data center to the problem of traditional enterprise provisioning, a traditional data center, if you look at a lot, especially in the enterprise, so the network is where you stick a lot of stuff for a good reason, which is a center point for having that stuff, right? So things like segmentation, things like security, things like billing, things like basic virtualization primitives like VLANs and VRFs. This is stuck in the physical network um, as part of the physical network, and then you can now run applications unmodified. So if you do a comparison on like an OpEx CapEx side, yes, it's not as nice of a model, but it's great from the perspective of I've already got trained guys working on this, um, and it works for every workload. So the high-level idea, if you want a high-level mental model for network virtualization, which is, OK, can we do kind of the best of both worlds somehow, which is you can use any application, any OS hypervisor, but then we'll have a thin layer that actually reproduces networking and software. And then you can have any type of hardware that you want, which is can you provide the ability to build kind of OpEx, CapEx type for a modern data center for traditional IT and having that model? So that's, that's kind of the high level idea. And what's nice is if you ever get to a point where you're kind of having these kind of like, you know, performance scaling type questions and you're not sure whether the architecture works, you can always go back to kind of the SaaS model where it does work. Right? So it's very clear that you can do this because this is done all the time by the most successful data centers on the planet. So at an architectural standpoint, clearly you can do this. At the world, uh, you know, in the high level world of trapezoids and circles, you can definitely do this. Now the question is, is can you do this in a way that's consumable by IT? Okay, so you know, we've had, I mean, there's been various production deployments of network virtualization, whether it's kind of open source plugins, whether it's uh, products, for quite a while. And I've you know, been tracking this for a while. And I think that you know, even though we've had like, a few um, strong production deployments in a while, like, this is the year where like, everybody seems to be going into production. So in two 2010, I think people thought we were totally nutty. Uh, and we were a little. In 2011, I think there was general consensus that you could probably do this. Um, but between 2011 and 2012, a lot of people didn't want to be the first one to stand in front of the bullet. Um, but over the last couple of years, we've actually seen a lot of production deployments, which is really cool from a technologist perspective because now we're like, okay, finally, we got, like, we got something in. It's a core platform. It's a core technology. Now, what can we do to like, extend the state of the art, right? Like, virtualization is an indirection point. It's not just about making things fast. It's about like, using that as leverage to change the laws of physics. That's what virtualization does, right? It's like it allows you to like stand outside of something. If you have network virtualization in, then we can, do, we can actually push use cases that you couldn't do otherwise, that if you didn't have that level of indirection. So that's what I want to talk about for the last half of my talk. I already mentioned this, which is the primary use case is agility. So let's talk about going forward. OK, so the first one is visibility and debugging. So in my opinion, um, virtualization kind of broke visibility and debugging, which it wasn't really good to begin with. So in virtualization, you've got two problems. You know, the vSwitch like sucks in a bunch of the network, 
which traditionally you didn't have visibility into, but more so just because virtualization decouples compute from location. If VMA can't talk to VMB, you kind of have to find out where they are. Maybe it's not that hard. Clearly, we've got tools that allow you to do this. Um, but in my opinion, network virtualization actually provides the right abstracted model for visibility. So let me try and, let me try and argue that. So network virtualization is not new as a concept. We've had virtualization primitives in networking forever. We've had VLANs, we've had VRFs, we've had MPLS. I mean, you know, networking is a virtualization substrate. But what we've never had is we've never had a single abstraction, right? What we have is a collection of abstractions. So if I give you like a collection of mechanisms, I give you a VLAN and a VRF, and I give you policy routing, and I give you an MPLS LSP, I've given you a bunch of MPLS primitives, but I haven't given you a virtual network that you can like point an SNMP sniffer at that will show you the entire network. Right? This is the difference between like virtualizing memory and CPU and storage independently and having a virtual machine, right? Networking has always been this kind of mismatch collection of virtualization primitives. So if you look at a modern data center and you try and do visibility and debugging, you've got one very complex network that's all of these virtualization primitives kind of mixed and matched. If you do something like network virtualization, the way that I like to think of it is, is instead of having one very complex network with no clear abstractions, you've got n networks. You've got the physical network, we'll call it network zero, and then you've got networks one through n, which are the virtual networks. And all of them will support standard tools and standard interfaces. So if A can't talk to B, you take your SNMP sniffer and you point it at virtual network that they're connected to, and then if it's a physical problem, you take the same tools and you apply it to the physical, pro to, to, to the physical network. Okay, so that kind of gets us back to where we are, but I actually believe that you can go with network virtualization because you're at the edge, I think you can go way beyond what we can do today. And so this is one of the pet projects that I'm working on. Actually, all of the ones I'm gonna talk about are pet projects I'm working on, so they're kind of dear and dear to my heart. But let me start on this one. So this is actually a dashboard for our internal OpenStack cloud that we use for development and for labs and all sorts of stuff. This is VCOps, which is a, it's a VMware tool. I'm just using VCOps to show you like, um, the virtual networking system I work on, what's exposed is an API. Nothing I'm talking about is specific to product. I just want to talk about network virtualization in general. These are just slides to kind of provide um, a visual demonstration of what I'm talking about. So on the left, those are virtual networks. We've got, I don't know, 10,000 of them or something like that. And every one of these has a different topology. So I mean, it could be L2, it could be L3, it could have load balancer firewalls. It's all sharing the same physical infrastructure. If the dot is green, so things seem to be pretty good. If the dot is red, there's a connectivity issue, and the dot is yellow, there's some threshold that was crossed. And I'll talk about that in a second. On the right, you actually have the topology for actually, I'm not, you guys probably can't see it, but one of these is actually showing the virtual topology, and then right below that is all of the things we track, things like whatever, it's latency, Rx counters, TX counters, so forth. And this is like network wide. And so for a lot of the, a lot of the, the clouds that I've worked with, like the way to determine if there's a problem is you wait for the phone to ring, right? It's actually very difficult to determine if there's an issue. But the idea is because you own the edge and you see all traffic going over and you have to monitor this anyways and you have an overlay, there's no reason why you can't proactively check all of this stuff and monitor it in real time. There's no reason why I can't give you like a full dashboard, and this is independent of a virtual network system you have, of the entire system. Not only that, you should be able to like map from this virtual realm down to the physical realm. So let's say you're like, okay, I'm going, having a latency issue here where my latency has gone up and I don't know why. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to then map down to the physical world and ask questions about the physical world, like which paths is it taking? So actually, for example, this picture on the bottom is a heat map of the physical fabric. Again, we have to maintain all this state anyways. That's what virtualization is. I mean, virtualization is always this, like, I've got a, f <laughs> it's, a it's actually always an array, right? You're always like, I've got like a physical address space and I've got virtual address spaces that mapped onto it in real time and I have to maintain that mapping. So I already have it, whether this is virtual memory or a file system, I have all of the translations that I need and I'm monitoring all of those. So I can provide you a global view of them, whether it's for the physical address space or the virtual address space. And so this picture is to demonstrate that you should be able to drill from virtual view down to physical view and then the, the 
the opposite from a physical view up to a virtual view, and you should have full fidelity, like the ability to see all of the counters and all of the bytes at the right level of abstraction. And like the ability to piece together a global view is, is very difficult in networking because you have difficulties with global consistency, right? Like networking is built around eventual consistency. It's very difficult to be like, here's my network state at time x. And this is not something networking has had traditionally in the distributed consistency model. It's always been like, well, if something changes and after a period of time, I'll give you an answer. But while it's changing, you never have consistent views. Virtual networking, you have to maintain this array. You have to maintain virtual to physical mapping. It has to be consistent. So that can become the basis of any sort of visibility. OK, here's another one of my pet projects, performance optimization via elephant detection. OK, very quick data center theory. OK, so in, in a data center, most of the time when people measurement, measure it, the vast, vast, vast majority of flows, if you're looking at flows, are small. And we call them mice. The vast majority of packets are actually in large flows, and those are called elephants. So the classic example is mice are often these kind of real latency-sensitive, bursty things, and then someone will migrate a VM or do a backup or transfer a file. So this is actually one of the biggest performance issues in data centers is this dichotomy. And let me explain why. There's actually two problems. The first one is TCP is really good at filling buffers. That's what it was designed to do. And so if you have a very long-lived flow, it likes to fill buffers. And so end-to-end, -end, you'll have all of these nice buffers filled. Now, if you've got very latency-sensitive traffic and it's going through the same path, it's going to take all of the queuing delay. Right? So now if I have something very latency sensitive, it's sharing the same buffer, like anything that's kind of interactive or latency sensitive is actually going to become a performance problem. Very classic problem in data centers. It's called uh, elephants trampling on mice. The second problem is mice are bursty. They're very bursty. They're so bursty you can't do anything smart with them. You can't adaptively write, uh, route mice. If you do, if you're like, trying to do something smart with them, like adaptive routing, like by the time you've made a decision, it's probably no longer relevant which is why almost everybody relies on ECMP, multipathing. If you do hash-based multipathing, it's stateless, it uses randomization, and you're always within a factor of two of optimal. So that works great for mice. For mice, hash-based multipathing, fantastic. For elephants, it's horrible. Because since you don't have any knowledge about the elephants, and there aren't very many of them, the algorithm can map two to the same link, and now you've underutilized your fabric. So these are the two problems with elephants and mice. Right? You introduce latency, and then you can suboptimally use the fabric. So there's all sorts of proposed solutions for this. right? Like, and they're all really simple. If, if I can identify elephants and mice, throw them in separate queues, I've solved the latency issue. I'll just use DSCP bytes, district code point. That's easy. Um, I'm going to continue to use hash-based multipathing on mice, because I can guarantee that's near optimal. And for the elephants, I'll actually do something smart. Like I will route them per flow and make sure that they don't share the same length. Good. I can, oh, oops, this is wrong. So I should be able to turn elephants into mice, not mice into elephants. So one, one thing I could do is I could take the elephants, and I actually could split them up by modulating the ephemeral port and turn them into mice. You have reordering issues, but like modern day TCP stacks are good with reordering. Like modern day SAC is actually pretty good with reordering, so maybe you don't care. And another one that actually comes up a lot is like, you know what, I'm going to have a different, I'm going to use a leaf spine architecture, and in my spine, I'm going to have an optical spine that I'm going to send all my elephants to. So the mice will stay on my normal network, and my elephants I'm going to send on an optical spine. So these are all good suggestions, but the problem is, is traditionally in networking, it's very difficult to detect elephants. Very difficult to detect elephants. Fortunately, this is something that's very simple in, in you know, virtualized network environments. And so Open vSwitch is a project near and dear to my heart. It's actually done per flow tracking forever, like since the very beginning. So there's no reason that you can't use the vSwitch to track all of the flows, and then based on either operator input or throughput tracking, actually detect whether something's an elephant and signal that to the fabric. So you either mark it, say, say we decide this DSCP bit means elephant, you can mark it on the packet, or you can actually signal the fabric and say, I've identified an elephant, and here's the five tuple. This is very, very, this is very difficult to do in hardware because of SRAM density issues. It's very easy to do in software on the edge. And so we're working on, on a project. Right now, it's total kind of skunk works fun thing that, that I'm just interested in doing, which is within Open vSwitch, exposing a column 
in OVSDB, which is all the heavy hitters that you have network-wide. So for every, for every server, here's all your heavy hitters. And we'll just use throughput as the metric to determine it. And then you can have something like a centralized SDN controller of your favorite choice. We will go and we'll network-wide, globally, we'll list, like, say, the top 10 or the top 5 or whatever you want. And that can actually signal to, to the physical network to say, here's an elephant, do something smart with it, or just throw it in separate queues or whatever you decide to do. Make sense? The bottom line is this has kind of been like one of these sticky problems in networking for a really long time. And either you know what your elephants are or you're kind of screwed. And like, I think that there's a chance here, because of the semantics we have in the edge and because we're in software on the edge, we don't have SRAM density issues, that we can actually solve it. All right. So finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about policy. Um, this one's going to be a little bit more philosophical in nature. So I talked about. I think, I think we can actually extend the state of the art in visibility and management. I think we can really extend to the state of the art in performance in networking. I think we can actually change the way you do networking. Policy is a lot broader than networking, but it's a great place to have the discussion. So let me just describe. So what is policy? So policy is just business logic applied to systems. Things like um, we never put apps from different BUs on the same network, right? These are things that people come up with that are written in documents that come from human beings that are applied to systems. That's what policy is. And if you look at most policy systems, they're generally a subset of data log, meaning you've got condition, action, just like SQL. Most policy engines look like this, right? So you're like, you know, if, if the user is Martin and you know, it's before 10 AM, then go ahead and log the traffic because he never gets up that early, right? This is basically what policy systems do. And they're almost always declared over site-specific namespaces and logic, right? It depends on the site. So I got into this whole area actually from the policy side. That's what I used to do is policy. And the problem is in networking, the way that you write policies, you've got some policy that goes to a policy compiler. Policy compilers kick off a con connectivity matrix. But mapping from that output to a physical network reduces to the network virtualization problem, right? So this is totally not obvious to me early on, but it actually reduces to the network virtualization problem. Like if I have a connectivity matrix, it assumes effectively a flat network. And if I'm mapping it down to an apology with enforcement points, I have to solve the network virtualization problem. That's why most policy compilers either suck or they will constrain your topology heavily, or they will expose the topology up in the policy space, which is not what you want. If, I, if I'm writing a document with a policy, I don't want to declare it over a topology. I want it to be totally independent because it's a business thing. Now, this has been the state of policy for a very long time. If you have something like network virtualization, you expose this idealized view for the policy compiler to write to. So I have my high-level policy compiler. I can write any sort of policy I want. I compile it down to this kind of platonic view, this virtualized view. And then the virtualization layer then maps it down to the physical topology. And if any change happens in the physical network or whatever, that's handled by the virtualization layer. So now we can build these kind of real robust policy compilers, like high level, integrate with AD, LDAP, like, like actual data log language compilers that will manage an entire network. Like I think I can like manage all connectivity in an entire network from like one language spec. But I think that you have to solve the network virtualization problem to do that. Otherwise, you end up trying to solve it in the compiler, which is too difficult. So I actually think this is very important because Policy is something you can't really automate away. It's something that all users must use. And so I think what's really important from a policy standpoint is that you've got broad ecosystem. Um, meaning, you know, we, so we go, say we go through all of this effort to, to do OpenStack. We automate away the provisioning interfaces. You've disaggregated software from hardware, and everybody's happy. If you slap a policy, language on top of that that's from, like, say, a hardware vendor or, or even a software vendor that likes vertical integration. And then it, that, since that's the top part of the stack, you can now vertically integrate the entire stack through it. And I actually think that the next big strategic battleground is around policy for exactly this reason. So I think it's very important when we talk policy, governance should be open, totally open. I think ecosystems should be totally huge. And there's no IP in policy. There's like, we all know the technology here. There's nothing new or interesting. So the most important thing is that we have an open governance model, which I think is why OpenStack is such a great forum for these policy discussions. 
It's nice because there's a whole bunch of them happening. Um, there's one that we're going to have on Wednesday at 440. Unfortunately, I've, I'm actually in a couple hours going to Tokyo, so I can't be there, but many people will be there, and I really encourage you to go. And I'm basically out of time. I don't think I have time for questions, so I think I'll, I'll end it there. So thanks so much, guys. <laughs>